So y'all remember a few months ago, I chronicled our trip to Florida in June. Remember that we, you know, for those of you that were here, there are lots of different stories that came out of our trip that we took in the month of June this year. And for some of you that are just getting to know me, I've been married for nine years to my beautiful wife, Jericho. We have three children, uh, Judah, who's eight, Journey, who's six, and Royce, who just turned four years old. And we, we got really bold and rambunctious this summer and decided to drive 23 hours to Florida together. Whew, I'm still processing that trip. But one of the things that happened while we were there that was kind of funny is we were staying uh, in this uh, residence, this area, this townhome of a friend of ours. And on this particular property, there were alligators. I mean, we were literally um, like right outside of our door, 10 feet away, was like this body of water. And I'm just like, okay, kids, you stay away from the body of water. Like, you know what I'm saying, parents? I mean, I I don't need to to make the trip really bad by having something crazy happen. And so anyways, my antennas are just up. I mean, mean, stay ready so you ain't got to get ready, right? Ain't no alligator going to catch me slipping. Like we pull up into the parking lot at night and it's dark out and I'm just like tiptoeing. Like, I mean, I am hyper aware. Spirit of God on me. Like, <laughs> alligator better not come near me. I'm going li- to go down fighting at least. I'm going to wrestle this thing or something. I might lose. I'll probably lose. But <laughs> so one night we pull up, it's dark. And on our way home, Journey spilled uh, like her ice cream all over the back seat. We were in a rental car, so I wanted to kind of get this thing cleaned up. So the rest of the family went inside. Journey and I were outside, and I got the door open, and, um, and I'm, I'm just cleaning out this car for like five minutes. And while I'm in the middle of cleaning this car out, Journey's sitting next to me, not really helping, but kind of encouraging me. <laughs> Thankful for your encouragement, girl. But she was also on the lookout. I didn't know she was, but all of a sudden she says, Dad, there's an animal coming towards us. Now, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, oh, Lord Jesus, I'm about to wrestle an alligator. <laughs> oh, my greatest fear is coming. To... But it was crazy because I'm in the car doing my thing and I turn. And, and it happens so fast, lickety split, and it's dark out. So all I can see scurrying at us are these eyes that are glowing in the dark. And so I have no time to figure out what is scurrying towards me, but I'm pretty sure this thing's an alligator, a small little alligator or something, but I have no time to determine what it is. All I know is I threw Journey into the car. I jumped into her car seat. Shut the door. I'm like, you ain't going to get us today. I'm like in the car, like trying to, where'd that thing go? I don't, I don't know. I don't, now at this time, I've got this, this interesting tension going on on the inside because I'm like, Journey's watching her daddy. <laughs> so I'm scared as all get out to get out of this car, but I'm cool, I'm cool, it's good. We, we got this girl. <laughs> but on the inside, I'm like, I do not want to get out of this car right now. <laughs> So it's so funny. This was a mystery. It was the mystery. We finally made it inside and Journey's like, you won't believe it. An alligator came chasing after us. And like her and I were so convinced that it was an alligator. And I'm like, oh man, this is going to be a great story. I mean, I can't prove whether or not it was an alligator, but I'm pretty sure it was. I saw its eyes glowing at me. So I am like, I was already hyper aware. Now I'm hyper, hyper, hyper aware And uh, it's funny because my wife forgot some stuff in the car that night. So she's like, can you go get it? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, babe, absolutely. Oh, Lord Jesus, please. So we're like freaking out for 24 hours or so. And then the next night we pull up. And sure enough, we see a little animal. And it's a little raccoon. (laughs) I'm like, 
oh my gosh, I thought it was an alligator and I was that scared for a raccoon. <laughs> Threw my daughter in the car. You're probably like, why are you telling us this story? I don't really know. <laughs> but all I know is I needed some courage in Florida. And I just started to think about how so often in this life, and as we even think about the particular season that we're in as a church, vision season. How many of you know that this isn't just a couple people's vision? If Love Church is your home church, this is our vision. He hasn't called a few people to reach the city. He's called all of us to reach the city. We like to say this, we're better what? Together, baby. We're in this thing together. And certainly, He's called us to take new ground in North Omaha. Can I get an amen in this place? He's calling us to step out and step up and trust him. But the beautiful thing is collectively, he's inviting us into the more. He's calling us into vision in this particular season. But how many of you know that in this room, he's also doing that for us personally? See, see we're in quarter four of 2023, and there's many of you in this room that are starting to ask the question, you're beginning to ponder and reflect around how this year went. You're starting to think about the state of your marriage or you're a father or mother in here and you're starting to think about your investment in your children. There's some of you that are businessmen and women in this room today and you're in this particular season evaluating how this year went and starting to look to 2024 to get vision for your future. Vision, vision is important. You know, without vision, we perish. If you don't have vision, you'll drift into the future and nobody drifts to a desired destination. Vision is great, but how many of you know that seeing vision come to fruition is difficult? Because walking out the vision and call in our lives, it costs us something. Oftentimes, the thing that it costs us most is our comfort. So in this, in this life and in this season where God is calling us to step out as a church, where he's calling us to step out personally, we've got to start asking the question, do I have the courage to walk out the very thing that he's called me to? I think today, I love this, this verse of scripture from Deuteronomy 31.6. If there was one thing that I could just prophesy and speak over your life today, it would be this verse of scripture where God says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Does anybody receive that today? Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. Do not be afraid or terrified because of fill in the blank. What is the fear that's holding you back from stepping into what God has called you to? What is that fear? For many of us in this room, it's fear of failure. For others of us, it's fear of what other people will think. Fear is false evidence appearing real. And we confront fear with courage. That's what we do. We look fear straight in the eyes and we say, fear, you're not going to hold me back. My God is bigger. My God is greater. My God is stronger. And I'm going to step in the midst of fear. Hey, listen, don't feel condemned if you experience fear in this life. Just don't submit to it. Just keep moving forward in the midst of it. We have to understand that the enemy of our soul doesn't want us to step into all that God has for us. He's called us to the abundant life. You know, we talk about experiencing God's best, and, 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 and I want us to understand that the various things that God calls us to participate in and to step into, they're for his glory and his glory alone. But we are his plan A. There's a reason why Jesus came to planet Earth, lived for 33 years, paid for our penalty of sin on the cross, rose from the grave, and now sends his spirit into those that receive him by faith. Why? Because that was his mission. 
He wants to partner with you and I to walk out his mission on this earth, but it's going to require courage. And I think today we're going to look at Daniel, and I think Daniel is, is such a beautiful picture of what it looks like to be courageous, not just one time, but to live a lifestyle of courage. This week, we studied in our daily reading, uh, Daniel 1 through chapter, chapter 1 through 7. And all I kept seeing come up throughout this week was this theme of courage. I'm going to teach from Daniel chapter 1, but we might reference a couple other points where Daniel exemplifies this courage. Now, a little bit of context of where we are in Scripture. If you're new to the Bible, Daniel was a prophet. This is the Old Testament. And in this particular time period, uh, Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, defeated the Israelites and takes some of the Israelites into captivity. And Daniel is one of those Jewish boys. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar, he recognized that, man, that, that there were some talented young individuals that were coming into Babylon and so he found those people and he recruited them and he was going to train them for his purposes. I think it's such a good picture of what the enemy is trying to do. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. We just tell our kids this all the time. Like, what team are you going to be on? It's really as simple as that. I'm going to ask you today, what team are you going to be on? We got to get off the fence because the enemy owns the fence. Today is a crossing over. I see it in the spirit. This is a Joshua three moment where you're going to step into your promised land. And I believe by the spirit of the living God, there's going to be a courage that comes within you where you're going to stop conforming. You're going to stop compromising. You're going to stop living your life for the praises of people. And I believe today you're going to cross over and start walking out the call of God on your life. It's what's going to happen. Let's check it out. Daniel chapter one, starting in verse three, it says this. Then the king ordered Athanes, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Here it is. Verse four, select only strong, healthy and good looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. So we see here that King Nebuchadnezzar is, is, is empowering this person to go recruit these young men, and he gives them uh, some things to look out for. And then here's what he says, train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the, enter the royal service. Verse 6, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, Azariah was called Abednego. Now pause here because I think it's interesting that in this particular moment, they're renaming them. They're renaming them. As a matter of fact, their, their names were godly. Names in Jewish culture meant a lot. Like, for example, Mishael means who is like God. And yet now they're renaming them. And it's so interesting because I started to think about this, that are we walking in the name that God gave us or what the world calls us? We need to walk in who God says that we are. Now, here's the beautiful thing, and you're going to see this. Man, I just, this is just too good. I, would, I don't know where we're going right now, but God's just moving this thing. And here's, here's the beautiful thing that I, I just want to share with us today is you're going to see here through Daniel's life, there were certain things that he allowed 
and there were certain things that he took a stand for. We have to, have, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom on which mountains to die on, which hills to take a stand on. And in this particular moment, here's the beautiful thing. He didn't take a stand for the names that they were changing, and here's why. I, I, I feel this strong. Somebody needs to hear this today. Because they were trying to write new names on their mind, but they couldn't erase who God called them in their heart. They knew who they were deep down on the inside, so it didn't matter what they called them because his voice was louder than theirs. Come on, somebody. Verse eight, and here's like the verse of the message right here. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given them by the king. Another translation says that he purposed in his heart. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. Do you see how God just goes before us? His grace is being poured out in certain situations. Verse 10, but he responded, I am afraid of my Lord, the king, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other use your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. Verse 11, Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And here's what he said. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water. Now, I want to pause here and I want to, I want to share something because as I look at this idea of courage all throughout the story of Daniel, what I don't see is prideful courage. What I see is courteous courage. Listen, if we I love what Skip Heitzig says. He says we have to be winsome if we're going to win some. And in this particular moment, I love this, that he's, he's requesting, he's asking, he's saying, please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water. Verse 13, at the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends look healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. Verse 17, God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. Verse 18, when the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them 10 times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. When you and I take a stand for God, he stands with us. It's so beautiful. We get this picture of just God's favor coming upon these young men that are living their lives with conviction and courage. God is doing exceedingly abundantly above all they could think, ask, or imagine. And I love this because I believe that this is even God's kindness. See, Daniel wasn't more concerned about his influence. He was more concerned about his integrity. He, he wasn't trying to earn the respect of the people around him. He was more focused on righteousness. And as a result of having this heart posture, God continued to stand with him and give him favor and use him. 
We need to catch this because I see so many young, ambitious people in the church that want to take ground for Jesus. But the question I'm asking is, do we have the integrity that allows us to not just take ground, but stand our ground? To not just get there, but to stay there. We don't want to be overexposed and underdeveloped. We've got to allow God to get some convictions deep down on the inside of us so that we can experience the favor of God so that he can receive the glory through our lives. I want us to think of, about this question this morning. What is the courageous step? What is the courageous step or the courageous stand that God is inviting you into this morning to take in your particular life? I want you to think about that. Because some of us right now, we're th- this is for my spouse. This ain't for me. Oh, I'm thinking of that friend, that friend that needs this word right now. Right now, in this moment, Holy Spirit, reveal to each of us, myself included, where are we conforming? Where are we compromising? Where are we not stepping into the things that you've called us to? Would you reveal it right now? Would you show us where we need to step out in courage? Where are you calling us into courage in Jesus' name? It's interesting because I think about the Apostle Paul. When you think of courage, don't you think of the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul said this, though. I think it's interesting. He said, man, I keep doing the things I know I'm not supposed to do, and I don't do the things that I know I'm supposed to do. So here's what's interesting. In this particular context, in this particular story, Daniel needed to exercise courage to withhold himself from doing something that he thought would dishonor God. Now, the reason why he was refusing uh, the meat and the wine uh, from, from the king's court is because they were sacrificing this stuff to false idols. So, so in this particular instance, he needed courage to stand against. But just like Paul says, he's like, ah, I'm doing the things I don't want to do. So sometimes we need, there are some of you right now, you need some courage to stop doing some things that are prohibiting what God wants to do in your life. You need the courage to stop today, to take a stand, to say no more. I'm not giving into that any longer. I'm crossing over and stepping into what God has for me. That's the courage that you need today. And oftentimes in our life, it's this kind of courage that's the most obvious. Because a lot of those things that we need to confront are external. We know about it. We just heard the testimonies of it. You know, some of you in the room today, it's like you can't put down the bottle. You know you need to say no to that. It's very obvious in your life. The fruit is very obvious. But when Paul says, I don't do the things I know I should do, come on, somebody. Think about that for a second. There are some of us in this room today that the thing you need to be courageous about, you've never shared with anybody. I'm talking about a dream that God put in your heart. I'm talking about some gifts down on the inside that God is saying, this is the hour to start exercising the gifts that I gave you. The gifts were never meant to serve yourself. They're for my glory. It's time to step into those things. So the question we need to be asking today is what is the courageous step in this vision season that God is inviting us to take? For some of us in the room, inside of this church, you've been coming through these doors on Sundays, and God has been whispering to you, it's time to get surrounded in a group. Right now, the Holy Spirit is saying, don't do life alone. You were hurt by past relationships, and it's created apprehension for you to step out and step into godly friendships. And today, we break that off of you in Jesus' name, and I'm just believing that courage is rising up in you because we're better together. The atmosphere you permit decides the products you produce. You're becoming like the five people that you hang around. And I believe this. God is taking you somewhere, but there are some people that he's calling to go with you on the journey. There's other, others of us in this room that we've been on the receiving end of what God is doing here. Praise God for that. 
We're so grateful and thankful for every single person from front to back in this room today that is receiving from God. We serve a generous God. Jesus said, I came to serve and not be served. But here's what I know. There are faith is exercised and God calls us into the more. There's a discipleship journey that we go on when we stop being a consumer and we step into being a contributor. And for whatever reason, there's been imposter syndrome and insecurity that's been rising up in you that's prohibited you from getting in the game. And today God is calling you. He's saying, get in the game, get in the game. I think the third piece is this. When we talk about being all in at Love Church, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about being in a group, being on a serve team, and putting God first in your finances. You're like, oh, no, OC, don't go there this morning. Go there, it's vision season, baby. It's vision season. Here's what I love about vision season. God determines our vision. The Holy Spirit is speaking where he would desire for us to go. God is determining the vision. We bring the provision that determines how fast that vision comes to fruition. He's calling some of us out of comfortability and into sacrifice. You can't expect new blessings off old sacrifices. I might be blessed, but I'm not comfortable. I want to continue to stretch and I want to continue to lean into Holy Spirit and say, God, how are you calling me to sow into what you're doing? How are you calling me to sow into your kingdom? How are you calling me to raise up treasure in heaven? Is anybody with me today? There's nothing wrong with stuff. There's nothing wrong with investing in yourself. There's nothing wrong with any of that. Please don't hear that today. Praise God. Go crush it. Go kill it. Go bless your family. Go, go live blessed life, but put God first. What's, who's going to be on the throne of our life? So these are just a few examples that I believe God is. He's moving in our hearts this morning saying, will you step out with courage into my invitation. Are you feeling it? Are you, are you sensing it today? What is it for you? What is that thing? He's inviting all of us. All right, here we go. I'm going to give you my one point today. You ready for it? It's called the courage cycle. The courage cycle. As I look at the story of Daniel, as I, as I just study this chapter and chapter two and then you look at chapter six, and even right now, I just want to story tell a couple different examples. In this particular text that we just read, we obviously see that, that the king's delicacies didn't look like delicacies to Daniel. They looked like defilement, a good picture of a man who's connected to God. So we see this, this connection. It starts with connection, because how many of you know this, that righteousness without relationship will eventually lead to rebellion. Let me say that again, because somebody in here needs to catch this this morning, because you've been trying to do the rules. You're trying to do the church thing. You're trying to get your life together. You're trying to live this righteous life without a genuine relationship with your creator, and you wonder why you're in the cycle of rebellion. In the church for a month, out for a month around the people of God for three months, and then nowhere to be found. Man, I would be tired too if I was trying to live a righteous life with no relationship. As a matter of fact, that's my story. I grew up, and that's why I got frustrated, and that's why I found myself in cycles of rebellion, because there's no power when you're disconnected from the source. See, that's the advantage that you and I have as New Testament believers. We're not in the Old Testament. We don't have to follow the laws to be right with God. We just got to be in Christ, hidden in Christ, empowered by his spirit. And when this happens, we can have deep fellowship, deep connection with our Savior. And I think it's so beautiful because I want you to see this in David's life. Look at what this says about his connection in chapter 6, verse 10, it says this, but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, 
And what he's talking about here is in chapter six, do you remember this? There was so much favor on Daniel that the people of Babylon that he was serving alongside got jealous. So they go to the king and they convince the king, they actually stroke the king's ego by saying, hey, for the next 30 days, if anybody worships anybody other than you, we're gonna throw them in the pit with lions. He's like, ooh, that feels really good for my ego. I'm gonna go ahead and sign that. But he wasn't thinking about one of his best, Daniel. So check this out. It says this. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and he, look at this, I love this. He knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day. Here it is, here it is. Catch this, catch this. Just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. This was not a rebellious response. This was a consistency that was already established. He said, I need connection with my God. I need connection and fellowship with my God. Prayer shouldn't be our last resort, but our first response. I'm talking about consistency over intensity. Is anybody with me today? I say this, he who kneels before God can stand before any man. The secret place is the secret sauce. Connection. We need connection and fellowship. I was, had a chance to be on a mountain this week, and um, I was spending some time with a, with a new friend. His name's John Gordon. I want to give him some credit for this because he gave me a prayer acronym this week that I've been using, and, and this has been helpful for me because I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't remember to pray, and so I need I need tools like this that can help me. And there's some of you in here right now. You're saying, yeah, I'm being inspired by OC to connect with God more, but I'm going to walk out of this place. And how do I actually do that? Can I give you some handles this morning? I want you to write this down. This is a prayer acronym. You ready? Here it is. Number one, praise. Enter his, his courts with praise. Praise. Number two, repent. Oh, I love that. <laughs> repent. Repent. Number three, ask. Come boldly before the throne of grace. Number four, yield, yield. Number five, expect. Another word that I would put here is like trust, like expect and trust that God's going to move on your behalf. And then here's the last one. And this is what a lot of Christians struggle with. Receive. He's a good father. He wants to bless you. He wants to meet your needs. He wants to give you peace that surpasses understanding. He wants to grant you Courage. Is anybody with me today? I remember, um, we're going to have to cut this short. <laughs> I just saw the clock. We're going to have to land the plane here, but I do want to share this story. This is, this is, um, I think you've heard pastor Todd share this story before. And, uh, it's pretty funny because there was this one moment where we were working out. I don't, I don't remember if cap was with us or who was with us on our team, but we were at lifetime fitness and Somebody started getting up in PT's grill and I was with him and there was something that rose up in me. And it's funnier when he tells the story because he's like, yo, I, I, I didn't know what was what what was going to come out of OC in this moment. But in this particular moment, I I felt something rise up in me and, and I started reflecting on this moment. And here's what I wrote down, that my response was connected to my love for PT, not my hate for someone else. It was my close connection that established a conviction that I will stand up for my brother. So I'm trying to make a connection here to connection, the power of connection and how it's through connection that these convictions are established. That's the second thing here, convictions. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them. He didn't see delicacies. He saw defilement. Why? Because through his connection, convictions were established. Convictions are simply this. It's the state of being convinced. To the degree in which you are convinced, you will be convincing. I like to say this. Convictions are like a deeply held belief. And I say this, your belief 
determines your behavior. So if you don't like your behaviors, you don't like your outcomes, you don't like the certain things that are happening in your life, you need to get some new convictions. Convictions drive standards. You don't rise to the level of your goals or you don't move in the direction of your vision. You fall to the level of your standards. It's why we need to get connected so we can get some convictions established because it's our convictions that help us walk in courage. In courage. If we have no convictions, we'll never be courageous because we'll always choose our comfort over the growth that God is asking us to step in. You can have comfort or growth, but not both. I want to tell somebody that today. Don't run from the discomfort. Here's what I want to tell you. Lean into it. Lean into the discomfort. I want to finish with this story because what I want you to understand is that as I hold this microphone, I'm in it with you. We never graduate past our need for God to help us step into all that he has for us. You see this repetitive theme. Remember Joshua chapter one, Joshua and Caleb, 40 years prior were the ones that went into the promised land. The 10 other spies come back with a bad report. They come back with a God report saying, if God called us to it, he's going to see us through it. But you fast forward and Moses is done leading the Israelites. Joshua is stepping in. And what, are, what does God repeat over his life twice? He says, be strong and courageous for I go with you. See, he, even he needed to hear it. He needed to hear it. And I think we need to hear it today. I remember a few months ago, um, I had the opportunity to go speak to a financial firm. And I sometimes just chuckle at God opening these doors for me to go into the corporate space and encourage teams. And on this particular, uh, at this particular event, there were leaders from all over the country flying in and they're in the financial space. I'm a pastor. So I'm in this room and I'm just like, I mean, oh, I stepped into this room and all of a sudden I'm just being confronted with every insecurity, with imposter syndrome. Why are you here? What are you doing? You should just go ahead and go tell the guy you're feeling sick and just get in your car and drive home. I'm being 100% real with everybody in this room right now. So I'm sitting, you know, back here where Verb's at. I'm sitting about where he's at in the room and I'm going after another speaker that's joining me. This particular speaker, I won't share his name, but he's a nationally renowned speaker. I mean, he's, he, a week before this, I saw him speak at GLS to hundreds of thousands of people. Dude is so gifted. It's unbelievable. Like in the craft of speaking, I'm like, dude, this guy has some, um, some amazing skill. He's become a dear friend. So there's this tension that's happening even in my own heart where I'm like, I'm championing him. I'm like, yes, this is amazing. I celebrate who you are in Christ and the gift that God has given you. And simultaneously, there's a war going on the inside of me that you don't belong in this room. Just leave this room. But it's when you and I are confronted with opportunities to compromise what God is calling us to step into, we have a decision and a choice to make, and we don't have to do it in our own strength. And so you know what I did? I did what I only knew what to do. I started praying right there in that ballroom. I started praying, and I started just speaking life over the situation, and here's what I did, and I'm going to give some people some tools in here today, because here's what I had to do. The talk ended. I went up to my friend. I said, man, great job. I went behind the stage. I had about a 15 minute break. And here's what I did. I needed a physical reset. So I looked at my hands. I held both of my hands out and I said, I'm in this room to serve, not be served. I'm not in this room to be affirmed. I'm in this room because God called me to be in this room. And if he called me, then I belong in the room. And so I'm going to act like it. I'm going to act like I was a servant sent from God to deliver what it is that he wants me to, to, to deliver. And then I stood there and I learned this from Pastor Craig Rochelle. When he stands in the front row and he's feeling that imposter syndrome and that insecurity, he takes a giant step forward. 
to signify to all those lies that I'm stepping out of my insecurity and imposter syndrome and into God's purpose for my life. So let's stand to our feet because I believe that that's what's happening in here today. And in this moment, I believe that God is, he's challenging each of us on the step that we need to take this morning. And I pray that you wouldn't leave this place today without taking action on what it is that he's putting in your heart to step into. But I believe that there's another group of people in this room today that maybe you've been coming for a while or maybe it's your first time. And I'm here to declare over your life today that the most courageous decision you could make before leaving this place today is placing your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Here's what I want to tell somebody today. This morning, before I came onto this stage, I opened up my Bible to Matthew chapter 26 when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the night before he's going to be crucified and he goes into the garden with his disciples. And I want you to picture this moment fully God, fully man, can't even fully comprehend what that must have felt like. But in that moment, there was so much pressure. There was so much grief in his heart at the mission that God was inviting him to fulfill that he asked his homies, his disciples, will you just stay with me? The savior of the world needed his crew in a moment of pressure so much pressure that he began sweating blood because he was going to go for the, to the cross and pay the penalty for you and I. And here's what I love about what the Bible says. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You know what the joy was? It was you and 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 it was you you. for the joy set before him. He made the courageous decision to go to the cross and pay for our sin. Is anybody grateful and thankful for that in here today? So maybe you've been trying to figure it out on your own, or you've been trying to come to church and you've been confused that, man, the way to get to heaven is to be a good person. God didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And in our sin, we're dead, but you can be raised a new life today by repenting of that sin, placing your faith, your hope, and your trust in the finished work on the cross. That's the invitation for every single individual in here today. And like those people that shared their testimony today, God can do the same in yours. So if you're ready to make that decision as the band plays, I want you to be bold. Come forward. Maybe even just make your way now. Come on. I feel courage rising up in the room today. Today is your day. As the band plays, make your way forward. 